Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar, IBMI in 2022, It's Not Just an AS400. Uh, IBM's uh, Steve Will will be talking to us today about AS400, Power10, IBMI, 7.5, and other topics related to this wonderful platform we know as the IBMI uh, platform and the Power10 server today, as that's all been announced. Uh, I'm Tom Huntington, Executive Vice President of Technical Solutions with Help Systems. Today's event is going to be recorded. There will also be handouts. There will also be a chance to ask us questions as we go through. We'll do a Q&A at the end. This webinar is a little longer than what you might be used to, but Steve has so much great contact and such a great story here to, to tell that it's a 90-minute event. Um, we'll also have only two polling questions and a little infomercial break in the middle from Help Systems. Uh, Steve, it's an honor to be with you today, and I know uh, many people may not know that this year you were also, I guess, is it appointed or honored with the distinction of IBM um, Distinguished Engineer, and uh, that's a really thing, a proud thing to, uh, for the, uh, really for the IBM I community to be proud of, and of course yourself and your colleagues Thank there you. at Rochester. How are you yep. doing today, and what do you do for IBM? Um, I am the... Um, Chief Architect, which I've been now for this platform for going on 15 years coming this August, which means I'm responsible for the strategy and the plan for the IBM I operating system. I work with my team to figure out where we're going to go. Uh, I work with our client base to figure out what they're going to need. And then I work across IBM with the various pieces of IBM that I need to interact with and integrate with. Um, this year, as, as you mentioned, I was promoted to Distinguished Engineer and given the title of uh, CTO, uh, Chief Technology Officer for uh, IBM I and um, it's it is a representation of IBM's um, increased commitment to this platform um, I am now technically an executive uh, with IBM and IBM only has a certain number of executives and they wouldn't appoint an executive on the technical side um, if they weren't uh, serious about the future of the platform. So I get to participate even more heavily than I have before in the setting the direction of power and of IBM in general. So it is a definitely a good news story for the whole platform and I'm, I'm honored to be able to be that face for everybody. Well, we're honored to have you again with us, Steve. So let's uh, let's get into the content that people are waiting to hear about. All right, let's go. All right, folks, as Tom said, I have been doing this presentation, but I modify it every year. But I'm going to start kind of the same way I start all the time, and then we'll diverge, and I'll explain why I've got the format that I have. Look, I present to clients all over the world. I spend a great deal of my time doing that. I am usually in front of clients um, some way or another two or more times a week. Many times when I'm presenting, whether it's at a user group or for um, people in the corporate executive offices at customer shops, I have to describe for them what the architecture of the platform is. And I usually only spend a brief period of time doing it because I have other things that I have to talk about. And so when I do, I always show them these five cornerstone elements of the platform. DB2 Fry and its single level store integration, dealing with data in a very unique way that provides significant value to our customers. Our object based architecture, which is one of the many architectural elements that help protect the security and integrity of the platform. The virtualized work management, the ability to run multiple workloads and manage multiple workloads on one platform without requiring a hypervisor um, has been a part of this platform's architecture uh, since the beginning. Integrating various things that for other platforms have to be purchased and, and added separately is very unique to IBM I. People will argue with me that Linux is approaching this and, and we can have that argument some other time. But from the beginning, the integration of this based on the object architecture and the DB2 that we store things in is considerably more tightly integrated than other platforms have. And finally, and very, very importantly, the technology independent machine interface, which has guaranteed for our customers that if they compile a piece of code as far back as they want to in this architecture, it will run today unchanged on today's modern architecture. These architectural elements are 
the basis of a lot of the value of this platform. And so I will describe when I'm talking to clients the IBM I architecture in this way. Now, if I am with some people out there who, particularly in small user groups where there are people who've been with the platform for a long time, they may stop me when I show that and say, hey, wait a minute, you just called that the IBM I architecture, but I remember the days of the AS400 and that architecture looks very much like that. In fact, if the person has been around long enough, they might even say, that actually looks like the System 38 CPF architecture, Steve, it's not IBM I. And so, Yes, I have heard this many times and I have said, you know, let me explain. Okay, it is certainly the case that some core elements of our architecture <clears throat> came not only from the AS400, which is probably what people will tie it back to first, but actually the System 38 and I'll show you the System 36 provided the layer of architecture that allowed us to build what we have today. And over the years, through the years, we have used that architecture as we've evolved the platform. We became, as a platform, not AS400 anymore, but I-Series in the year 2000, with much of the architecture that the AS400 had carrying us into that environment. We then merged with, consolidated with, the rest of the power platform and became IBM Ion Power Systems. Um, in 2008. And again, the architecture, there are some core cornerstone elements that are certainly there, but there was an architectural revolution that happened in the early 2000s that has continued to happen as we've moved into the 2010s and now 2020s as IBM I on top of power. So while there are a lot of little things that happened from the very beginning of this platform until today, and while many of the pieces of code that you wrote back in 1988, if it compiled back then, could still run today, we are not the same platform. And just as a, a way to think about it, and again, I'm not here to argue naming so much as to help you understand how this architecture had to change as the, as the uniqueness of the hardware that started this platform merged with something that could run AIX, IBM I, and Linux all at the same time. Back at the beginning, the platform that you ran on was the AS400. Right? That's what people think of. The operating system actually had its own name. It was called OS400. Okay, So <clears throat> the architecture of what I showed you, while there were pieces of it that were implemented in the hardware platform, the AS400 platform, primarily it was an operating system architecture of the OS400. When we became iSeries in 2000, OS 400 was still the name of the operating system. So OS 400 as a name, by the way, lasted longer than AS 400, even though people sort of interchangeably used them. And then for a very brief period of time, we became System I. That was when all of the systems got their own letter number or, or letter assigned to them. Yes, they had iSeries and, and Z series and P series before that, but they became System and then that letter. Okay, and when we did that, that was in the Power 5 time frame. So some very bright people in marketing decided that we had to change our name from OS 400 to something that was tagged to the Power family that we had. So we became I5 OS. Um, we explained to them that that was not a sustainable thing because then you'd have to change the operating system name every time you went to a new Power family. And that's a very expensive process without any real value. So when we became Power Systems, we became IBM I. We have been IBM I now ever since. So that's 14 years now that we have been uh, IBM I on Power. Um, so. That's the name of the platform we'll continue to use. I will talk about AS400, iSeries, and even the earlier systems as I need to as I describe the evolution of this platform. Before I get there, I think that Tom has something he wants to pop up. Yeah, it's time for a polling question, Steve, and a really good start there. It's fun to see that uh, IBM I, 14 years already have I been doing the math correctly, and we hope you can participate in this polling question. How much experience do you have with IBM I? Um, and of course, it could be AS400 and could even be System 38. And for some of you, it might even be before that. So more than 30 years, 21 to 30 years. 
11 to 20 years, one to 10 years, less than one year. And I'd love to have more categories, but the polling feature only allows for five. <laughs> so choose one, that's the reality. Um, you know, interesting enough, I, I certainly wouldn't have wanted to be called I-10 OS, if you think about <laughs> Power 10 that we're finally, uh, or completely out on the marketplace with, right? Um, speaking of that, Help Systems is, you know, one of the things we do is sizing for the new power servers, and we can size Power 9, Power 10, we can do consolidation, and we can do that for IBM I, AIX, and Linux, Linux on Power. So uh, if you need any help there, reach out to IBM. They got IBM Tech Line that uses Performance Navigator, and then a lot of the business partners, like the, the tech datas and the arrows of the world, uh, use that technology. So let's see here. Looks like um, enough time spent on a polling question. Let me close the poll and I will share the results, Steve, so you can see who's with us. How much experience do you have? Looks like we have 42% um, being the largest for more than 30 years, 23% uh, in that 21 to 30, 18%, 11 to 20, 12%, one to 10. Uh, so we get some definitely newer people with us and less than one year, 4%, which is still a significant number considering we have around 400 people with us today. So. Wonderful uh, news, a great uh, audience with us today, Steve. Um, back over to you to move along in the content, or in case Sounds you have any good. thoughts on that. Well, that no, that's great. By the way, I, I did a version of this at Commons Power Up Conference in New Orleans that was specifically requested for the people who are new to IBM I. And I had a fairly decent crowd of folks who were new to IBM I. And there's there's a number of folks there. And the, anywhere from zero to 10 is pretty new to IBM I. And you may never have learned this stuff before. So I'm happy to teach it to you. But I, about half of my room was was people who've been with the platform for a very long time who got um, a chance to get updated. And so I'm definitely going to be speaking to all sets of, of you out there. Don't worry about it. Um, you're going to learn something, I think, no matter how long you've been with the platform. All Thank right. You. So let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. When the folks in IBM Rochester who were producing both the System 36 and the System 38, both at the mid and lower end of the marketplace. When the Rochester folks who were producing both of those systems went to the corporation and said, we want to build a new platform that is the combination of the System 36 and the System 38, what they did was they built themselves a, a presentation that told IBM, here's what we see in this lower end of the marketplace. The folks who are buying our systems in the small and medium business space are buying it to run solutions. There are a lot of solutions on System 36, not so many on System 38, but the core value proposition that we can bring to the marketplace is to be the best possible business solution platform. So here are the things every application that is intended for business is going to want to solve. It's gonna have critical business data, but but the application doesn't want to have to manage that, particularly where you put it on disk and how you find it and all that sort of thing, how you do all your relational stuff. They don't want to deal with that. They're going to have to have security. So many people back in the 70s and 80s who were writing applications had to integrate their own security that they built themselves. They would want the platform to do that. They would want it to be flexible enough that they didn't have to say, well, if you're a, you know, two or three users, you use this system. Otherwise, if you're five or 10 people, you use this system. And let me tell you, back in those days, there were some applications that had to deal with, depending on how big you were, you had to have different versions. They don't want that, okay? Now, this may seem natural today, but at the time, it was quite revolutionary. And another piece of that was, they would like it, the application developers would like it, if all the pieces that they needed would be integrated into the platform so they didn't have to have dependencies. They didn't have to assume that somebody had bought some other package. And then finally, the investment protection. I already mentioned when I talked about the machine interface before, if they write a piece of code today, they don't want to have to rewrite it just because the vendor, the hardware vendor, came up with a new family of processors. And yet, that was the way the world worked back then. And so the architecture was put together for the AS400 that had DB2-4i and single-level store put together. 
this object-based architecture, all those things that I talked about before. Now, throughout the course of the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be delving into how each of those pieces, while they do still exist in the IBM I architecture, okay, they have evolved through time. But before that, I want to talk a bit about this this message that we drew you in to the web webinar with, which is that IBM I is not just AS400. If you look at today's IBM I strategy, it has these three core components, has since I became chief architect 15 years ago. Okay, we are the solutions platform. We do things so that our solutions vendors have what they need to build today's and tomorrow's applications. We give you choices on how you implement your solution, whether it's the languages that you use or how you deploy that thing in a cloud, hybrid cloud, whatever you want to do. And then we want to make sure that we give you choices on who you can hire. We don't want you to have to go and hire only people who know this platform. And then no matter what we do, we're going to integrate what we have, giving you as integrated a solution as we possibly can. That is how, as a business, we have been able to continue to grow, especially over the course of the last 10 to 12 years, uh, the core of when I've been chief architect. We have spent more of our time growing than not, okay? And we've been able to do it because of this strategy. But if you look at what the AS400 could have been for that strategy, it just doesn't measure up, okay? If you talk about, the solutions on the platform. Yes, AS400 had solutions when it initially came out, but those solutions were not modern and they weren't mainstream in IBM. Okay? The things that we want people to be able to do, like using the latest, best IBM technology, AS400 was on its own. Everything we had in the AS400 was unique to us, and we could not have continued to invest in the advancement of that technology separate from the rest of IBM. We were also tied to old technology in the, in the things that AS400 had, and there was no way on the AS400 we would have been able to incorporate with the initial architecture that we had things like mobile interfaces or the consumption of real-time data from sensors and other Internet of Things. And, and you'll understand why as I go through the evolution of this, okay? And yeah, yeah, we had things even way back then called service bureaus, which were similar to cloud, but they weren't cloud. Then if you look at the second aspect of our platform, open, no, we were proprietary. Until we did PACE, and it was an accommodation, and we'll get there in the presentation, we didn't have anything that could be considered open. Okay, we couldn't do open source languages, we couldn't do cloud type technologies, and we were definitely tied to the things that were unique to IBM I for hiring people in. This is one of the reasons why people still tend to try to hire people who have AS400 specific knowledge, even though people who come to IBM I today can probably use many of the, um, many of the pieces of knowledge and tools that they had, that they learned in school outside of IBMI to manage IBMI and to code on IBMI today. Now it is true that we did have a very integrated platform. That was true. It was part of our personality that continues today. It helped drive the low total cost of ownership and so on. And the AS400 value proposition certainly was around delivering simplicity and providing exceptional security and so on. Okay, but we were not able to leverage other parts of IBM. Over the years, we have had to evolve this architecture so that we could incorporate things like, for example, the newest things in database, whether that's row and column access control, temporal support, whatever we wanted to do, that had to come from an, a collaboration across IBM and, in fact, across the whole uh, relational database technology. We had to incorporate into our security things like single sign-on and other security and authentication method mechanisms like um, Kerberos. We had to be able to incorporate and integrate open source things because that's what our solution providers needed. We had to be able to do virtualization, not just with our subsystems and the ability to, using our security model, hide uh, data from people who should never see it, but we also had to be able to do things across virtual machines. And then as the 
as the machine advanced from generation to generation, we had to be able to take advantage of those things and then converge with what AIX was doing and ultimately Linux on Power was doing and take advantage of some of the things that were being built into the power processor specifically for them, while they also got to take advantage of some of the things that were being built specifically for us. Now, as I go through the rest of this presentation, I will be putting a little icon down in the corner showing you which part of the architecture I'm talking about as I do this evol evolution. So here, notice I'm talking about that technology independent machine interface as I describe the layered architecture of the original operating system upon which IBM I is based, which is OS 400. Okay, way back then we had this technology independent machine interface that separated two parts of the operating system, but really the operating system was sort of three parts. There was the stuff above the MI, which was called OS 400, and then there were two microcode layers, vertical and horizontal microcode layers, that then sat above and, and used this unique hardware. Okay, so that's what the architecture looked like back at the beginning. That is not what it looks like anymore. Okay, in fact, I'll explain as I go through this how we got from where we were then to where we are today. But one of the ways that I have modified this um, modified this presentation from past years is that I'm trying to going to try to show you sort of all in one story for each of these uh, parts of the architecture, what the steps were. But before I do that, let me just show you what the architecture looks like today, okay? The architecture today, yes, still has the MI. You can see it in the middle of that pink box down there. But we have had to do far more integrating of things above and below the MI so that we could make best use of the core of what the lowest level of the operating system does. Things like tasking and queuing and, and the mirror technology, install and serviceability, they underlie everything. If you tied this back to what we would have looked at in the previous chart about being the horizontal microcode, much of that stuff that was in the horizontal microcode is now in that gray box that I show you at the bottom here, but it's not actually separate, okay? Back then it was. Now it's not, it's all incorporated here, but all of this stuff builds on top of it. And a lot of the things that we do actually sit above XPF, above OS 400. Um, so things like our web services server, the tools that we use for doing development like RDI, RDS, Merlin, and so on, they sit above the operating system level, but they take advantage of the things that are there. Okay, so I, again, I will describe for you the evolution of this part of the MI as I go through this, but I want you to understand things look way different today than they did before. And one of the biggest ways that it looks different is because of the stuff on the right-hand side there where we've got this whole AIX operating environment called PACE that allows us to do open source and Java, which kind of crosses the line between operating system and things sitting in the operating system. All right. So we will get to everything, I promise, but now let's go to another piece of this. One of the things that people will always recognize as being unique to IBM I is this thing that we call single level storage, right? It came from Dr. Frank Soltz's uh, PhD paper. That's one of the reasons he was hired into IBM was to help uh, implement this thing. And the whole idea was at the time and still today, outside of storage area networks. People who have systems have to manage where that data gets stored so that the system can access it. And the, the uniqueness, the value, the genius behind single level store was, and is, if you could, as an operating system, manage all of your storage as if it's one piece of memory, then you, the operating system, could decide when should things actually be stored on disk in where should it be stored, okay? All while having your programs that are written on top of you just treat everything that's in storage, not as a thing that's on a particular volume and a particular track on a particular disk, but as just one thing that has its own unique address. And you could deal with that. 
and that would be great. Okay, so that actually was created as part of System 38. It allowed System 38 to spread the data onto whatever storage was attached to System 38 so that the system could optimize its use. It also integrated nicely with the database that was part of System 38 so that then the database and storage management could work together so that it could balance things correctly. So that's, of course, what we had. It was very, uh, I've just shown you a picture here to show you kind of what, what an address looked like and what it meant back then. Um, this is this was available in the initial specs of the AS400, so there's nothing being confidential here. And, and by the way, it's not this way anymore. But one key piece of this was that every address that we had was not just a set of bytes. By the way, it was a set of bytes. It was four words put together. That's what the address was, four words put together. But it was also an indicator for each of those words in storage that it was part of one of these single level store addresses. So there was a thing we call a tag added to each one of the pieces of the address so that the operating system and the hardware knew this should be treated differently from just a normal string of bits, okay? That single level store using tag bits often got people to say this was the 65th bit. It essentially was actually 65, six, seven, and eight um, bits that indicated that these parts of storage were um, unique. They should be treated uniquely. So system 38 had this thing and it was single level store and it's a part of this platform today, but, but, <laughs> is single level store the same on AS400 as it was in System 38? It is not, was not. People, again, think of this stuff as being immutable. It came into existence from the mind of the great creators of the platform and never changed again. It actually changed in AS400 from System 38. You see, people who were designing the AS400 said single level store is great, but you know, we ourselves in the operating system and customers might want to have a good business reason to group some of the storage and then have single level store, yes, manage things, but manage things across groups of storage. And so they wanted to have these groups. And so those became what are known as auxiliary storage pools. So from the very beginning of, of AS400, it changed what System 38 single level store was to be multiple parts of a single level store stored according to these auxiliary storage pools. Okay, So that was key. It's important for you to understand that even when you think back on AS400 having that initial perfect architecture and coming from the System 38, it actually had to modify for good technical business reasons from the beginning. Now I'm going to fast forward you a bit. <clears throat> Those of you who've been with the platform in the 30 year range, you'll remember this. But when we initially created this platform, we created it with what the computer industry called a complex instruction set. So we were at a complex instruction set computer. We had a processor that had far more instructions, well, considerably more instructions than a reduced instruction set computer had. And that that complex instruction set computer was the hardware that was at the bottom of this thing. Well, we knew that there were advantages to having a reduced instruction set computer. We also knew that the whole industry, and in particular, all of IBM system hardware was going to a risk-based set of processors. So we were going to have to deal with a new hardware, a new processor that was going to be risk. In order to do that, we had to be able to implement a new layer of the operating system below the machine interface that was going to adopt this 64-bit RISC processor. In order to do that, well, we had the architecture in place with the technology independent machine interface that would protect all of you, all of your compiled code that was compiled to the machine interface. We could protect that as long as we could implement all of the stuff that was in the virtual machine code and the horizontal machine code on top of this new 64-bit risk processor. As we looked at that um, internally, trying to figure out how to do it, what we ultimately had to do was write an entirely new set of the operating system. Everything had to change, okay? There is not a single piece of that stuff below the MI that still exists from the days of the AS400 in our below the MI stuff. It had to be entirely rewritten. 
So when we went from sys to risk, we also had to change how the addresses were done. Okay, so the single level store got affected by this change in how we did our technology independent machine interface implementation because the processor underneath the covers had to change. And so there was a retranslation required so that all of those addresses that were in your software, your software is dealing with addresses, all those addresses could now be addresses that were going to be implemented on top of the 64-bit processor. And so again, the addresses look different. And again, I'm not telling you anything that's super secret here. And in fact, things have changed slightly since then. But the point is we had to re implement all of that. So the single level store that existed in release one of AS400 is not the single level store, at least at the implementation layer that existed from V3R6 on. Okay, so there was a change in how all that happened. And then, then after that happened, a couple days, decades later, we decided that those auxiliary storage pools, we should make them independent of the machine. We should be able to create an independent auxiliary storage pool that, yes, while it was attached to a particular I series, while it was attached to a particular I series, it could function within that I series, but it could also be detached from that I series, AS400, but mostly I series, okay, and attached to another one and be inserted into the single level store of that other system. That independent auxiliary storage pool required us to make yet another major change to the architecture of single level store to allow that stuff to happen, okay? So that was another key change to the architecture. So while, of course, we still have single level store, it can now do more than it ever did. And we had to change all that stuff again without affecting what you folks did. Now, one thing about single level store is that every time you use it, the stuff that you use, uh, the stuff that you put in that storage thing is assumed to be backed by physical storage. Okay, so if you are manipulating a piece of data on IBM I and, it's, and it is a single level store address, it is going to be assumed that it's going to be put on disk. That is a valid assumption for the key critical business data that associate with transactions or user authentication, all that stuff that makes perfect sense. But in today's modern programming environment, there are things that don't ever need to get stored on disk. Temporary storage is used over and over and over again, and we'll talk about that when we talk about program models, over and over and over again, okay? But the temporary storage that was served up by single level storage is still backed by storage. So when you created temporary storage for the software that's running on IBM I's single level store architecture, we had to reserve space on the storage, even if it was never going to be used. And sometimes that temporary storage, because of the <clears throat> mechanisms we have for doing paging and so on, would get pushed out to storage, causing a delay. Why should it ever have to happen? And so we had to do something new and different, and we created this thing called TerraSpace. Okay, TerraSpace was conceived of as an address space that could sit alongside single level store, but it would never ever have actual physical storage associated with it and would never be pushed to any sort of storage device. So if you're running an application today and you have a, a, a temporary storage space stored in, in TerraSpace, you're manipulating things. And when you want to do something, you can do something that will get into single level store. You can create an, an insert, update, whatever to your database, and that will cross over into single level store and be stored on storage. But all the stuff that you're doing in TerraSpace will not, okay? And that is critical. It was absolutely necessary because every PACE-based application, which means every open source application, and any ILE application that specifically asks to use TerraSpace for its temporary storage, can now gain the benefit of super fast, compared to single level store, super fast temporary storage. So the architecture, again, about how we do storage management had to evolve over time. 
Now you'll recognize, and I'll come back to this idea of TerraSpace in particular and some of the in, uh, independent ASP stuff as I go through this, but let's move on to another part of this. The database that we had when AS400 first came out had initially, okay, the, the concept that everybody was going to use their data in relational ways. And so SQL was the interface that everyone was going to use. But because we came from the integration of System 36 and System 38, and they both had data models that were not that already, we had to have our database be able to handle things that were the data model of the System 36 and the data model of System 38. That was absolutely crucial to the success of us moving into AS400, right? We were able to move folks from those two environments, keep them up and running. But the other thing that it did was it provided people an opportunity to continue using those old data models and to not take advantage of that SQL interface. So back in the day, we had this query engine that had to take it had to know that most of the stuff that was coming into it as a query was coming in as a query that was from the system 36 or the system 38 data model and yes it might be coming in via sql but most of it wasn't so we had a very simple classic query engine that when it was asked a question in the form of query would have to deal with the fact that it could be coming in several different modes and so it couldn't be very complicated as it tried to produce its answer now over the years db2 architects who had decided from the beginning that the AS400 should have a purely relational database driven by SQL queries, they wanted to create a query engine that could take advantage of knowing that it was dealing with SQL and SQL only. It was not dealing with those old data models. If it could do that, it would be able to learn from the past and use what it learned from one query, from one application, to improve queries from other applications. But to do that, you had to know that it was coming through SQL and being implemented by this underlying architecture of DB2 interacting with our single level store. Okay, so we created this thing, the new query engine that was optimized for the idea that it was going to be coming in with standard SQL and it could do a whole lot more if it knew that. Okay, and it would give you that DB2 answer much more quickly and it would improve queries for other people because of what it learned about how the data was stored and how it was being queried. The thing is, we still had lots and lots of stuff, especially back in the 90s, that was in these old data models. And so over time, while we still had the query engine, the new query engine that was being implemented in the late 90s, early 2000s, most of the queries were being handled by the original query engine. And then over time, over time, over time, more and more of the queries, even the queries that came from the old data models, we found ways to send that through the new query engine so we could learn a bit more. There actually is still a need for that older query engine for some things that actually works better. So it's still there, but by and large, the database had to evolve over time. So yes, it's still part of the architecture, but finally, the query engine that was envisioned by the people who did the AS400 came into existence and got optimized for the kinds of things that are going on in the data world today by the time we became IBM I. Because you see, back then, what everybody used it for was purely transactional data purely relational transactional data, even if people didn't use it relationally. These days, however, people want to do things like analytics. Analytics was never conceived of when this, <coughs> this whole uh, architecture was created in the first place, but it was getting more and more important to business users and some databases out there in the world decided to re-implement themselves using, instead of a row-based, transaction-based uh, way of doing things, column-based. So you would organize your um, Organize your database, for example, based on uh, the state you're in. That's a column, okay? So things would be organized closer together in the database if they were all in the same state. I'm just using an example here, okay? But that slows down traditional workloads. And of course, most of the workloads that do most business still have to have traditional workloads as their basis, right? Transactions are the key to business. So the IBM I answer was to enhance the, the way we did our row level 
transactional focus thing with something called an encoded vector index concept that sat over the top of that, which would allow us to do analytics or columnar based things without incurring the penalty of having to reorganize and restructure the database. And that has allowed lots of applications to take advantage of it to not only do the things that they do super well transactionally, but also do things super well when they're doing analytics. This is just one example of a particular workload that is significantly better when you get to combine the row-based relational um, IBM I DB2 with the capabilities that we have for the encoded vector index. And again, that did not exist as a part of the architecture in the days of the AS400 or even the I series. This concept was added to the databases architecture when we got to be IBM I, and it has been a tremendous value to a lot of our clients. Now let's talk about another part of this. Remember that AS in AS400 stood for application systems. So let's talk about those applications. Now I'm gonna step back in history again, back to that single level store. And remember programming in single level store was supposed to provide significant value and it did, it does. Okay, but back then the programming languages that used that single level store in the very beginning were RPG and COBOL. It was great for that. Then came along already in V1R2, the second release of the operating system, the support for the C programming language. And that caused a yet another change. Why? Why? Because C introduced pointers. At the time, neither RPG nor COBOL had the concept of pointers, but if you know the C programming language, it is predicated on pointers. Everything you do is a pointer, which means there has to be an address. And that gets to be a problem because in the single level store, remember, everything is just an address into some part of storage. So your application and the things it's dealing with have a, a pointer to somewhere in the storage long, long storage uh, stream, and your operating system code is also running somewhere in that long stream of storage. So if you have a pointer that your application needs because you're running a C application, what's to keep you from doing some pointer math, adding a whole bunch, subtracting a whole bunch, and somehow ending up in somebody else's storage, okay, which was certainly possible. How, what's what's going to keep you from doing that? Well, in the original AS400 release one, there was nothing that would keep you from doing that. So when we added the C programming language, we also had to add security level 50 and the initial hardware support for storage protection of pieces of the operating system that were deemed to be sensitive. Okay, so we had to create storage protection. We had to create this thing called privilege and problem state support. So the things that were in the problem state, which is essentially the application state, they could not generate a pointer and use it if it was being used by programs that were running in the privilege state. And we had hardware that helped us protect that. Okay, that got built into the processors that ran release two and later. And by the way, that storage protection that was invented in the second release of AS400 has been carried forward to the power processor. We continue to use that architecture and it has modified over time. I actually don't have time in here to explain how it's been modified over time or how AIX takes advantage of it, but just trust me on this. As we've moved forward, we've had reasons to change this again and again. So. When we're talking all the things that AS400 had, each one of them has had to evolve. Now I'm gonna tell you more of the story after I take a short break to take a breath and a drink and let Tom talk to you for a couple of minutes. Steve, you've been going for 45 minutes strong. It's time for a break, I agree. So um, let's uh, just take a little break here. We'll talk a little bit about help systems. Um, just so you know, we've very solid around the IBM I platform, have been for years. Um, Believe it or not, this is our 40th year of being in business at Help Systems, and we continue to help people with backup and recovery and high availability on IBM I, both uh, data replication, software replication, hardware replication. 
with Robot HA and Power HA. Document management is a big play for us. We help people with scanning documents, spool data, all those things related to document management. Of course, cybersecurity on IBM I. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, monitoring systems, we have a variety of options there. Uh, business intelligence, as uh, uh, Steve talked about, you know, the SQE, the new uh, SQL query engine, uh, we take advantage of that and bring in business intelligence data out to customers. And then of course, capacity planning, problem determination, any kind of performance issue you have, we're always willing to help you out and take a look at that. And then uh, automation, that's where help systems started. So with the robot uh, schedule product, that was our founding product actually. And we still help people out with that and we can do that centrally. Um, go to the next slide and then uh, just to kind of also kind of drive home the point at Help Systems, we have uh, four power champions. Uh, we have myself, uh, Robin Tatum, Brian Nordlin, and Am Neeris. Uh, uh, you know, myself, I've been a power champion for quite a few years now. Robin has been for four or five. Brian is uh, relatively new. Uh, he works on the, the uh, Power HA technology, speaks at Common, and other things related to uh, social marketing around. Uh, the IBM I platform, Amneris is located down in Argentina, helps our LATAM customers and IBM uh, Latin America customers uh, get information on IBM I. And then our local uh, Q user president, uh, Chuck Lazinski, has been helping out with that for many years. Actually, he's not president right now. He's just a assist. He's a vice president. And the next slide, please. All right, we can hit the next one, Steve. There we go. And then from a thought leadership, there's some free artifacts that we have that I think are really helpful for you. Uh, whether you're a business partner or a customer, we have the annual IBMI Marketplace Survey. Um, just so you know, that survey, uh, we will conduct it again um, in uh, these fall here coming up in September and October. It'll be our ninth annual uh, meeting with IBM and a few other people in August to formulate the questions to make sure we have 7.5 and Power 10 in the survey. And then the annual state of the IBM I security study helps people understand things related to security. At Help Systems, we do a lot of free technology updates with our customers, which are great one-on-one -on -one discussions about what's new and what's on your minds. Uh, we also will participate in the solution edition program where you can get discounts. And then out of, also on our website, if you're interested in a local user group, Anywhere in the world, we have many of those documented for you out there on our website. So next slide, and it talks about the marketplace study. Uh, just a, a reminder, this is something we put out for, for years. Uh, you are helping the IBMI community when you take this survey because this information is used by Steve's team at IBM, it's used by Help Systems, and then all the other business partners around the world that I talk to, you know, somebody new every week that says, oh, I use your survey when we talk to customers. So this is important information for the ecosystem uh, around IBMI. So when you, when you see that survey in September and October, please take it. We usually have around 500 to 700 customers that take it each year. Uh, next slide, the state of the IBMI security study. Uh, just to remind you, we've been doing that for 20 years. We do a free security scan. We want you to be secure on this platform. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see some of the things that we look at. This, this scan only takes two or three minutes and we look at a high level. It's not a deep dive into every object on the system, but you will have an understanding of where your major weaknesses are in security. IBM's done a great job of securing the platform, but we like to say it's securable you as the administrator have to turn the dials to make sure that you have a truly secure environment. Because as we go on to the next slide, we'll see just from the last year's survey, the 19th annual, we see customers on average having almost 250, I say root profiles, so people understand from Unix, Linux, and, the, and, and uh, uh, Windows what I mean, but all object authority, 250 all object authorities on, on average, that's not good. 20% um, are still not meeting the minimum security levels like security level 40. Steve just talked about security level 50. Um, also, people aren't using exit point monitoring and malware uh, tech protection, uh, ransomware, things like that. We, we also at Help Systems have a, a partnership um, where we can do scanning with AV and we also now have some ransomware technology too. So the, the final thing we have is we have a polling question I'll put up, Steve, um, and that is, related to how can help systems help you? And we'll get back to the presentation. Uh, if you don't mind clicking on 
this. Uh, I'd like more information on capacity planning and monitoring. Maybe I'm looking at upgrading to Power 9 or Power 10 or consolidating systems. We can help you with that. Or even if you're moving to the cloud, you have to move to the cloud the right way and make sure you have the right capacity plan in place. Uh, BI access, of course, we help people with that. HA and DR, you might have some concerns there. We can talk to you about what is Power HA, DB2 Mirror, uh, software replication, robot HA. I do a lot of discussions with customers like that and my other colleagues do too, just to explain what are you, even what are all the virtual tape library options that you have out there. And document management is a big thing around today's um, community, uh, business world. We wanna do more and more unattended as we have workforce that's mobile. And then of course the free security scan that we talked quite a bit about. I wanna, pre I appreciate all that have filled out this uh, last survey here. And Steve, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Let me close the polling question here. And by all means, if you have additional uh, requests, uh, we will uh, take care of those in the Q&A as we uh, wrap up at the end today. Steve, back to you. Great, Tom, thanks. Um, I do wanna encourage all of you, please take the survey. Tom is absolutely correct. Within IBM, we, the IBM I team, is known for our client interaction and how much we know about our customers. And one of the key ways of doing that is by helping help systems do this survey and then taking the results from that and using it in our planning. Um, IBM, as a total, knows that this survey is out there and they ask us, what do we learn from it? And in fact, a few years back, AIX even, uh, I think, engaged help systems to do a survey for them as well to try and get the same kind of information from their users. It is super important and it is co constantly being used. So please participate. All right, let's move forward. I was talking about applications when I uh, went into my little break here. And let me tell you a little bit about um, how the architecture of the platform has had to evolve over time based on how programming evolved. Now, those of you who've been on the platform for 20 years or fewer probably don't remember having to write software that was monolithic. But back in the early days of computing, it was very, very performance-wise expensive to have software that was in separate places and then had to call from one place to another. From a performance point of view and a storage point of view, it was very difficult. And so people wrote software in monolithic ways, thousands and thousands of lines in one single program. That's what we came from, okay? But but computers got to be considerably more capable of being able to do quick instantiations from one program to another. And so programming, particularly as PCs came into existence, personal computers, as they came into existence, the programming world changed to the point where people wanted to write things in much more modular ways. And computer architectures were helping clients to uh, support and programmers to support this whole level of modularity. And so, AS400 had to invent a way to make it better on our operating system. And so we created this thing called the ILE. It was also somewhat colloquially known as the new program model, which differentiated it from the original or old program model. But the new ILE program model um, came into existence, uh, oh, and I'm showing you which parts of the architecture here this is talking about, okay, because before the introduction of ILE, resources like open files and so, so on that were used by a program could only be scoped to the program or the job, okay? There was no way to share them across things. ILE offered a third alternative that allowed you to create a group of programs that all had access to these things at once. So it certainly could be a program, it could be a job, or it could be this activation group. And as you created more modular pieces of code, you didn't have to have it all running within a program and the job wasn't efficient enough. If you created an activation group, you could share these resources much better. And so we had this concept of an activation group that had to get added to the architecture. Once we did that, we were able to have these modular pieces that could act as if in memory, they were all connected to one another so that 
when you loaded them, you weren't loading one monolithic piece of software. You were loading the pieces that were in the activation group that then had easy access to all these resources. It also made it possible for people to create and use modules, which are reusable, easier to debug, easier to add to in the, in the in every way that it is on every other platform, but we had to create an architecture on IBMI that would allow us to do that. So that was part of the evolution that had to happen to allow us to move into today's modern modular programming environment. There was another thing, however, that was happening, and that was where do you run your programs? Architecturally, how does the operating system manage that running program? We had jobs in the original AS400 architecture, still exist today, of course, there's still jobs, okay? And within that job, there was a process which was the implementation of the job um, in, in the rest of the operating system. It was fine, that was well and good, but in comparison to other architectures, setting up this job, which has a huge amount of information about the resources that are available to you and so on, and setting up the process that supported that job, comparatively to other things that were going on in the industry, they took a long time to set up. Well, applications were beginning to be written, not just modularly, but sort of asynchronously. They wanted to be able to kick off a piece of work asynchronously, have it do that work, have it report back, and then move on with what it needed to do. And they wanted to do that. Applications wanted to do that frequently. Well, that meant that you had to have a new thing in addition to jobs and processes. And in the industry, those things were threads. This was one of those times when the industry and the technology that was going on forced us to adapt and be able to keep up with how people were doing programming. So we had to create threads. Well, we had a particular application out there in the world that wanted to be able to use threads. The thing was we had implemented threads <clears throat> as a one thread per job thing. That meant every time you were doing a new thread, you were kicking off a new job and that was a mess. It was just a mess. Lotus Notes was the application that we wanted to get running on AS400 and then iSeries. So much of the competition that was happening on the AS400 and then early iSeries <clears throat> was because people were putting email servers from other vendors into their organization and then making people think that, well, since they use that platform for email, they should use it for other things. We said, if we can get an email plat or email uh, application on our platform, we can help fight that off. And of course, it needed not just one thread per job, it needed nice, high performing threads. And so we had to create a threaded environment within IBMI that would support that. And now, that sets us up to be able to do multi-threaded programming that can compete at a performance level with other things that were going on. And of course, Lotus Notes was super successful for a very long time on this platform because we implemented this thread-based architecture and the product used that. It was not, however, the only thing that took advantage of it because another thing that came along during that time frame was web serving. The hypertext transfer protocol came into existence. This, by the way, is a picture of the very first web page that was ever created and served up by the CERN web server. So at about the same time as we were dealing with the uh, need for threads so that we could do Lotus Notes, we were also seeing that people wanted to write applications that were based on web interfaces. So in V3R7, we created the very first web server that ran on OS 400, which was the web server that came out of the people who created web serving in the first place, out of Switzerland, the CERN-based web server. So we put it on V3R7, but you could only have one server. And as anybody who does application programming in today's modern web world knows, that's simply not enough. So in V4R1, we allowed you to have multiple versions of this CERN server. But what happened in the industry was that the folks who invented web serving and research decided they weren't gonna continue to maintain and enhance. Even though they had created the very first web server, they didn't wanna get into the business of creating all the innovations that were gonna happen around web servers. And so, 
the open source world was born because people out there in the world wanted to take advantage of this for web serving and other applications. They said the community could create a web server that would be able to evolve new technology over time. And so the Apache based web server was out there in the open world and we integrated that into IBM I's, well, into AS400's V4R5, right before we became I5OS. Okay, so we are now in the days where we have the Apache based web server on I series, never on AS400, on iSeries and that Apache based web server continues to be the thing that drives our open source or sorry our um, web serving based things it benefited from multi-threading it also drove requirements for several things including the thing I've already talked about TerraSpace okay because as you create a piece of work that comes in from the web you don't have uh, a need most of the time to have all of the stuff that's going on in that web program get stored on storage. It may do something in the database that needs to get stored in storage, but most of the operation that it's doing doesn't, and so it needs temporary storage that gets implemented in TerraSpace. Okay. We also had the need for digital certificates because the people who are connecting from the outside world didn't necessarily have user IDs and profiles, so we still had to have a way to prove that the system should trust them to do whatever operation they were doing, so we had to invent a digital certificate architecture, which I don't have time to go into. And we also had to create this whole thing called a server architecture, which is now used extensively within the operating system to deal with the fact that things, requests, could be coming in of various flavors, and depending on what they came in with, with and what what um, uh, protocol was being used, it would get handled by different servers. Maybe it's a database operation, maybe it's a web, maybe it's a web service, maybe it's a who knows what. So we had to whole, create a whole architecture for that. And now, what's today's environment? Today's environment is, well, I got to be able to do cloud. And yes, clouds use web serving and web app serving, which we have today, but as one of these surveys will show you, not only do we have to be able to do that, we have to be able to do that and incorporate that into the applications that we've had running on these platforms for so long. And we got to figure out how much of that cloud technology are we going to integrate with these modern applications. Now, in the world today, and you as a, as a user of IBM I, you've probably seen this, in the world today, there are plenty of competitors out there in the world saying, oh, cloud, you want to do cloud? If you want to do cloud, sorry, you've got to move off of IBM I because IBM I doesn't do containers, and so that yeah, got to move off IBM I, and that's just false. It's just false. If you've heard me talk anywhere for the last two years, you've heard me talk about how it's IBM I and cloud technology is how you move forward with modernization. I wrote a nice blog article about it. I've got full presentations about it. But <clears throat> the key here is that we have over time been adding and evolving this architecture so that <clears throat> IBM I and cloud technology is where you want to go into the future. The applications that you have, even the web-based applications that you have, are the beginnings of where you want to go for your next generation of applications, but they are not the end-all be-all. You need your next-gen application to be developed in a way that's very different from the way it was back in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. Rather than having a waterfall approach, which may take you 12 to 18 to 24 months to get to your new version of your software, you need to be able to take in a new business requirement and turn it around quickly. And that requires tools and processes that allow you to do these things things called DevOps, which is the flow from development into operations very quickly, or CICD, which is continuous integration, continuous deployment, where you integrate new capabilities and it gets deployed very quickly, all of which requires a new agile approach to do development instead of the traditional long waterfall development processes that are out there. And so as we do this, we need the incorporation of the technologies that allow our customers and the developers who work for them to do this to be supported on the IBM I platform. Similarly, a new next gen app application has to be able to take those modules that they created in ILE and service them up as services that are available to be called from 
things that are expecting a cloud to respond to them. And you need to be able to, from inside your application, call out to those services, because that's where a lot of great new value is going to be. And so if you're going to be doing that, you're not going to be tied to one programming language. You're going to have to blend your solutions so that RPG and COBOL and SQL do what they're really good at, transactions against a relational database. But then you have other languages that are meant to do things like services or web pages or analytics or machine learning, have those languages do the part of your solution, your application, that they're built to do. And then you've got to recognize that when you want to put all of these things together, you don't have to implement them all yourself. And while some of it can run on IBM I, if you can get, for example, an open source package that runs a particular set of robots or sensors and that runs in pace and it runs on IBM I, that's great. But if you have something that you're not going to run on IBM I, but you want to take advantage of it out in the cloud, you can do that. It's all part of your next gen app solution. And so you can have IBM I working together with stuff that's out there and available in the cloud if you prepare your application to do services and provide services. And we've had to modify our architecture to enable things so that things that are written in ILE and SQL stored procedures and so on, that they can be created as services that can be called by things outside of IBM I. When you do that, when you have an architecture that allows you to do that, you have a path forward for these applications so that they can become modern, not have to move off the platform, and still gain the benefit of all this technology that might be out there and available in the cloud. And in fact, you can have your technology in a cloud creating services. It is what many of our ISVs are doing today, creating software as a service, sometimes even as services as a service, running on IBM I in a cloud. It's as far as a customer knows or a partner knows, it's out there running in a cloud. It doesn't matter that it's not running in one of the big name clouds. It's a service that's providing value. Okay, so when clients modernize versus replatforming, what they find is they end up with a better result. If you have an application and you're trying to make the choice between should I modernize it, in other words, start with what I have and add new technology, changing the old technology as I go to take advantage of it, or should I rewrite that thing on an entirely different platform? Well, let me show you what has happened to folks who've done both of those things. When you're done with your project and you have modernized, your customer experience will be better than if you replatformed it. When you're done with modernizing, your performance will be better than if you replatformed. When you're done, your security availability and disaster recovery will be significantly better than if you replatformed. In fact, in every attribute of the application, it's been shown over and over again that you will be better off you'll also do it spending less time and less money and having less disruption. Because the architecture of IBM I has been built to allow you to modernize your existing software and to add new pieces of software directly on IBM I with modern languages, whether that's modern RPG or modern uh, open source languages, modern Java, you can do all of that on IBM I. So we have the ability with the architecture we have to move forward. And yes, you can do that in RPG. Because you can be modular in RPG, you can move towards this new services way of doing things. Because you can consume and produce data in common standard ways, whether it's in XML or JSON. Because you can make yourself a web service and because you can consume web services using RPG, you can modernize into this cloud world. Now, it's not the only tool that you need to have. You need to have tools that help you develop in a DevOps approach and you need to be able to move past the old version of RPG that was column-based to a freeform version of RPG that can be much more easily taught to programmers who are coming in from the outside world. And then, if you add open source to your personal toolbox, Node or PHP or Python, you'll be able to combine those things to the, have a, the kind of blended application that I mentioned as being one of the attributes for these next-gen applications. And all of that is possible because we have open source. 
on IBM I directly, not open source running on some Linux platform somewhere else, open source on IBM I. And if we're gonna talk about that, we have to talk about PACE. I've briefly mentioned it a couple of times, but by the year 2000, when we were becoming iSeries, AIX and OS 400 were both able to run on the same power processors. Okay, so that created the possibility that we could have executables, which are MI based, in other words, AS400 or TIMI based, okay, and AIX based running on the same hardware in the same partition. We just had to create within OS400, then i5OS, now IBM I, an environment where those AIX based run time uh, modules could run, those binaries could run. And so we created PACE. It is driven by a release of AIX that's fitted in to talk to Slick rather than talking directly to an AIX kernel. So when AIX in PACE needs a specific low level function from the operating system, we have it go and talk to our lowest level of our operating system, which is colloquially colloquially known as Slick, rather than talking to the AIX kernel. And then Slick dynamically toggles the power processor mode to say, am I talking in IBM I now, or am I talking in AIX? That's important because addresses are treated differently in AIX than they are in Slick, okay? Be particularly because of um, single level store, but also because of TerraSpaces, okay? The, the actual program, in, or sorry, the actual um, processor instructions are the same instructions, okay, because they're all running power instructions, but how you treat the stack, how you treat the um, addresses that are being used are different depending on your running, whether you're running in IBM I mode or where you're running in AIX mode, but we just take care of that. PACE, as I mentioned before, gets memory from the sl same slick TerraSpace pools that are used by ILE, so PACE uses all of its memory from that TerraSpace stuff that I talked about. And so we have PACE, which sits on one side of the operating system with these shared libraries that allow you to implement lots of different things, whether it's PHP or Ruby or, or SAP or whatever you wanna do, okay? And then that integrates with things that are in the more traditional side of the IBM I operating system. We therefore have all these new open and modern capabilities, whether it's the open R, uh, sorry, open RPG capabilities, the modern RPG capabilities, or the open source languages like R, Node, Mono, PHP, Python, etc., all running on IBM I. And the architecture of how PACE works is illustrated here. We don't have time to go into it, but you're getting the PDF for this. If you want to dive into it more deeply, you're welcome to. Um, it shows you how these things fit together. This allows us to have the modern next-gen application structure where we have pieces of our application written in the code uh, language that makes sense for the operation that they're trying to do. Okay, so that is a key to moving forward and required us to make several different architectural changes which never could have existed in the original AS400 and which were only laid the groundwork of when we did the PACE environment in 2000 when we became iSeries. Now, with the 15 minutes that I have left and I have to try and leave a little bit of time for Q&A, I do wanna talk about a few other things. There are things that people are talking about out there in the industry in terms of writing software these days. And I just want you to understand that with the core set of languages that have been always part of this platform, if you use the ILE version of RPG and the other languages that are on the platform together with SQL, you have all the capabilities that you need, but you also have to have a tool set that will help you develop those things in a modern way. And, and I can just tell you PDM and SEU are not modern and that we've had RDI out there for a long time doing things in a very modern way and it's super powerful and super efficient. But we also now have all the tools from the open environment that allow you to do open technology using IBM I. And when you do that, you can create these services and what people call microservices that are driving the cloud industry or the cloud technology in the industry. Okay, so all of that is possible. What people will tell you, however, is that you can't do containers on IBM I. And 
Well, that's somewhat true, but it's really backwards. Um, and I'm going to talk about that for a minute here. What you really want to do is to create services in the cloud world. Okay. People will talk about containers as if those things are equivalent to services, but they're not. Services are um, valuable actions or information that are going to pro be provided to the outside world. They are building blocks that are similar to the modularity that I talked about when I introduced the whole ILE thing. They can be very, very simple, in which case they're often called microservices, or they can be complex. Uh, doing a whole reservation on your website, on a, on a travel website, for example, is a complex service. To you, it's one thing, it's a reservation, but underneath the covers, it's built of a lot of different things together. And those things can be knit together if they are provided state information. For example, when you're doing that airline reservation, it has to keep track of who you are and how far in this process you are while it's using other little microservices to put together one big service for you. Now, well, people will tell you that those things need to be done in containers. Containers are very interesting and useful things. They provide you a complete environment for an application, particularly a service to run in, that has everything that needs to run that particular service or microservice. And it's isolated from anything else that's running on the machine doing its own thing. That's cool, that's wonderful, but containers only run on operating systems where the container platform has implemented itself. It isn't that containers don't run on IBM I, it's that no container platform has written itself to be able to run on IBM I using the IBM I infrastructures. In general, container platforms have said, well, Linux is very pervasive, I'm going to make my containers run there. Okay, I get that, I understand why they did that. Okay, but there's nothing that would prevent them from also doing the same kind of thing on IBM I. And in fact, we almost don't need it in some sense because IBM Ion Power can already provide you a complete environment with isolation. It's why people have been able to do different applications on IBM I in different subsystems or the same application in different subsystems without things running into one another for decades. Okay, you can create an isolated environment with all the information that you need on IBM I that does the service without a container at all. Now, might someday somebody want to have a container manager system run things uh, on IBM? They might, and maybe we can, but you can do all the cloud type things that you need to do today with what we've got. Modern RPG, being able to do modern development, doing connectivity to the clouds, and then incorporating open source and ISV applications can all be done today. Okay, and that's to help people get to that direction, we created this product that we announced this year called IBM I Merlin. It is a containerized set of tools that help you implement a DevOps environment so that you can get into this modern method of developing tools. It has to have an IDE. Now, that IDE assumes that your source code is gonna be stored in Git as opposed to being stored in the traditional file system by BMI. So there are tools that we have as part of Merlin that help you get there. You can use basically any IDE with Merlin that will also incorporate the source code into Git and then feed that into DevOps. And then we provide you the ability to do services and create services and consume services because that's what cloud-based applications are gonna need. Um, we'll do even more with that stuff into the future. But the key here, is that we're continuing to provide encouragement and architecture that allow you to do it. It's not the only way to modernize, it is a way to modernize, but Merlin is a wizard of wizards that allows you to move into this direction, but there are lots of other ways to do it, okay? Um, so, it's out there. Another key driver of architectural change that's happened in the last several years is a need for continuous availability. If you've been around this platform for the last few years, you know that we introduced something called DB2 Mirror in the 7.4 architecture, um, and it allows clients to have two operating system images that are paired together using a high-speed, low-latency interconnectivity um, to provide a continuous availability environment for your applications. This is not disaster recovery. You've got products like PowerHA that provide you disaster recovery. This is to provide essentially a cluster of IBM IIs that in a single data center makes it look like two systems are one system so that you can 
update things over time. Now that means that if you've got something running on system on the left-hand side, system on the right-hand side that are both doing things to the database, it looks like it's one database spread across systems. And we had to invent an architecture that would allow those two databases stored in separate single-level store instances to synchronize with the, one another as those things were happening. But we did that, we created an architecture that allowed us to do that. And so now you have the capability of having an active active solution on IBM I because of the architecture and the product built on top of that architecture. Now I have gone very, very quickly and I realize that. For those of you who aren't English speakers, I hope you're able to like take a version of this and slow down my voice so you have a little better chance of understanding what I'm talking about. But I do want to mention that there's so much that I didn't get to talk about. Some things I'm just going to mention. The development tools that I talked about are just pieces of this evolving story over time. We also had to have the ability, because we are spread across over 100 countries around the world, to have national language support built into the architecture of the system from the very beginning, something that our competitors certainly never did. The ability to display and print things changed over time to now we're using user interfaces that are mobile um, and even voice activated these days. Our ability to um, do directories that allowed us to know who people were had to change over time. We had to um, protect our operating system. Well, we didn't have to, but we chose to protect the integrity of our operating system using a digital signing before anybody else in the industry did. We had to be able to do uh, mapping of identities across platforms and across entire um, infrastructures. We had to be able to scale from a, a tiny tenth of a core or, or two tenths of a core up to 192 cores with 768 threads. We had to be able to make sure that the memory that you were using on a processor was as close as possible to the actual processor because on a, an, a power system um, it didn't just uh, by default end up that way. So over time we had to do those things but boy over time, there were so many things that we provided value to you on that required architectural changes. Creating a technology refresh, which we've done ever since 7.1 instead of a point release, required a whole architectural change in how we do fixes and updates and how those things were tied together. All of that stuff uh, required things. But, but there are a couple things I specifically want to mention. When the initial AS400 came out, as I mentioned, all of the hardware that we gave you was proprietary and unique to the AS400. So the storage that we gave you, of course the only storage that existed at the time was directly attached storage, spinning storage. We had 520 byte storage stored on disks, 520 bytes at a time, so that we could store those extra bits that we needed to do single level store and have tags. Over time, we couldn't continue to do that. 512 byte commodity storage became the thing everybody had to use. And so we had to change our architecture to how we did storage for single level store to be able to accommodate that. IO in the days of the AS400 moved from an IO processor where a lot of the IO that went on was actually handled by a separate processor, not the base processor of the system that was running the software. Okay, to an I.O. adapter where the I.O. adapter did very, very little processing and the, on the processor that's running your software also had to do the I.O. That changed significantly. And then networking. Oh my goodness, does anybody out there in the 30 years and more remember system network architecture? <laughs> it used to be interwoven into our what was called data communications. Before people called it networking, it was data communications. I'm not expecting you to read this. Look, if you look at the AS400 networking that came out, the data communications, there is no mention of TCP IP. I was involved in the second iteration of the TCP IP. TCP IP was initially created as a separate product on top of um, AS400 at the time, then we incorporated it into the architecture. Um, and then we had to reincorporate it again when we rewrote it again. So TCP IP, which is the way of doing networking in the entire world, did not exist in AS400 and it had to be rewritten three, maybe four, depending on how you count it times before it finally fit into the architecture. All right, so after all of that, let me sum up a bit. 
if you have a wonderful, beautiful, useful architecture, and you say that architecture is going to be the way it is forever, eventually what you'll have is a very pretty thing with a lot of aesthetics that doesn't actually perform a function anymore. The IBM I architecture was created with these five elementary things back in the days of the AS400, okay? but it's had to grow over time. We've had to take those five things and turn it into something that could not only be beautiful aesthetically, but could continue to be used throughout time. Okay, so we've had to evolve that. We've had to create new versions of it that incorporated this, these advances in this technology. So IBM I is now more than the architectural elements that still form its foundation. When we had our 25th anniversary several years back, I was part of talking about what 25 years on the platform meant. And I said at that time, technology is gonna change. That's one thing we know in the technology industry. The thing is the architecture of IBM I is built to change with it, but it requires constant maintenance and evolution. That is what the team in IBM I development does all the time. Where are we going into the future? Because we want all of our clients to realize that IBM I can do whatever you need it to do, okay? And it's because of this architecture that has evolved over time. I think I've finished with a few minutes for questions in case there are any. So Tom, I'll uh, ask you, have you seen any questions that I need to address? Well, first of all, big round of applause. That's, that's a lot of material. Mm -hmm. um, we have some people out there going, are you only going to talk about the AS400? Are you going to get to the IBM I stuff? I think you covered that greatly here in the last half. And kind of one of the questions where I think maybe uh, Rick um, was a little confused on what you're talking about, implementation of DevOps, CI, CD, Agile, and the cloud has been around for over 15 years. And um, he's saying hey, IBM's just announcing it now. Um, so, and, and what is no. IBM doing today to support block and chain was his other part of his question. <laughs> I'll turn it back to you to kind of comment on that one. Okay, so first of all, you have, you have had the ability to do DevOps and CICD on IBMI ever since we created um, the ability to do open source on IBMI. All of the pieces were there, okay? What we did as a platform was, because there are so many folks out there in the industry, companies out there in the industry, who are who make their living out of do mod, doing modernization of software and software development on on IBMI, we've kind of left that to them. What we've done is ask them, what do you need to have on IBMI so that you can create tools so that people can go out there in the open source world and get tools and run them on IBMI to support DevOps and CICD. So we did that. And yet in the surveys that we've done in our interactions with clients, what we have seen over and over again is despite the fact that it's been available out there for almost two decades, actually, the ability to do all this stuff, um, less than half of our, of our uh, ecosystem is doing anything like modern programming. And less than 25% have even stepped into DevOps. So when I talk about the stuff that we're announcing, it is part of a major effort we're having to focus people on. If you want to get the value out of your IBM I in today's modern world, people are going to be telling you, you have to do DevOps. People are going to be telling you, you have to do cloud. And there are ways to do that. Now we're creating a new product, Merlin, to try to encourage folks to do that because as I said, more than 75% of our customers haven't even taken the first step in that direction. Why not? Well, one of the reasons might be because they're waiting for IBM to tell them how can they do that and provide them a tool that will help them. There are other ways to get to DevOps, and we've got a lot of good partners who help clients get to DevOps and get to cloud, okay? But with so much of our marketplace not going there, we decided we needed to take the and make the effort to not only tell the story about how to get there, but maybe provide a tool that could help people. I honestly think that the best thing about Merlin and the next gen apps message is that people will start looking at doing modernization, both in their code as well as in their uh, development techniques that haven't done it before. It isn't that we haven't been able to do it, it's that people haven't done it. Now you talked about blockchain. Sorry, but blockchain is just 
just a protocol written on top of applications. We do have uh, uh, one of our um, teams in um, our development side in China who've been looking at blockchain since it first became something that IBM um, uh, majored in about six, seven years ago. And what they've been able to tell us is that all of those pieces to incorporate blockchain into IBM I applications are out there and available, most of it in the open world that can be connected to your existing transactions. And so it's just an extension of the modernization story. Blockchain is not exactly cloud, but it's similar to cloud because it's a bunch of different actors working together through services. Um, blockchain is just sort of its own unique version of that. Um, so the same message is out there. You can get the pieces to be able to modernize your transactional based application using blockchain um, and use it on IBMI today. Great. Thank you, Steve. I, I think people have to realize this is a progression webinar. It's not an announcement of this is new today. It's a lot That's of these right. things have been, been in the platform for many years. So um, yeah, the last let, me question just, here. let me just go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, um, okay. Okay. Maybe it, it jumped ahead here on me. Some people have negative perception of IBM I because of the native 5250 screen interface. Yeah. Are there plans to update the default system user interface? And we probably didn't talk enough about the new iNavigator, right? So maybe you can talk a well, bit about that. Right. So, how do you get into the platform, it depends on what kind of job you're doing. If you're using IBM I um, through an application, which is the way most people use this, then it's whatever the interface is that the application uses. And if they're still doing green screen, you know, I'd love to still talk to them because it's so easy to get to something that's better than that. Okay. But if the way that you're managing or using the platform is managing the platform, one of the reasons we've implemented the Navigator and ICS and so on is so that people don't force themselves to go back to this very clunky way of doing things that doesn't have nearly as much power or nearly as much ability to show you things as uh, the new Navigator does. So yes, I did not talk about the evolution of the management of the platform or the evolution of the op options for interfaces. You asked about the default way to go in. Well, the default way to go in, again, depends on what you're trying to do. And sure, we're going to probably keep a green screen emulator around for a long time because that's the default way some people use. But what we're trying to do is to encourage people to be able to do things in this more modern way. Let me well, let me Steve, address... if you think about it, the Linux, the Unix, the Windows, for that matter, all have command line interfaces too. Those Absolutely. things can't go away 100%. You know, I mean, they, you know. Yep. That's absolutely true. And then let me just address another thing that was part of the first part of the question that you had. Um, I restructured this presentation to show you how things changed from AS400 to IBM I. When I talked about TerraSpace and the, the changes that we had to make to our queuing model or, and, and our process model and so on, I was taking you from AS400 to IBM I today. When I talk about how changes had to be made to how we do software um, implementation to, to IBM I today. What I was trying to do was to show you that over time, every one of these things had to change from the way it was in the AS400 to where, where it is today in IBM I. So um, I'm sorry if that did not come across, but I think if you get the whole PDF and you look at it, that's I restructured this to instead of starting to talk back in 1985 and end up in 2022, to have sort of little chapters that carried you forward. Um, I can't do it all. Um, so anyway, hopefully it's valuable to most of you. Yeah, and we have several other questions out there, Steve. Um, we're not going to answer them right now. We'll, we'll take today. those questions. We'll take them offline. I know you, you have to get going, but to there's go a question it. out there about virtual tape library support. Um, there's uh, another question about you know, additional education. There is lots of opportunities for education. Look towards your user groups for one. Um, I mentioned QUser here that we have in Minneapolis, but there is some 60 to 100 user groups around the globe on IBM I, and you'll find a lot of that information, again, out at our website or just go out to our good old friend, the great Google, and search there or something like that, or if you use a different uh, search engine, certainly use that. Um, so, uh, wonderful to have everybody here. Steve, thank you again for doing this webinar. It's Absolutely. been a great wealth of information. And uh, hats off to IBM with Power 10.
and 7.5 here in 2022. It's not an AS400 anymore, people. Have a great day and have a great rest of the summer. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.